so now, sorry, um, the webinar is being recorded. Um, so yeah, let's now get started. So our first speaker today is Vivian Lee from Solutions for Our Climate. Um, Vivian is the head of the International Climate Unit at Solutions for Our Climate. Um, before joining SFOC, she worked in different embassies covering trade policies and public-private partnerships between Korea, Switzerland, and Denmark. Vivian will be covering the big picture of COP28 uh, during today's briefing. Um, go ahead, Vivian. Thanks, Ginny. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, I just want to start out with a positive note, how far we've come since COP26 when it comes to discussing um, progress on energy transition. Um, since COP26, we've noticed that coal has been politically out in many countries, and several of uh, major coal countries are working on various pledges and energy packages and transition finance packages for an early retirement of coal. Uh, however, this had also created another dilemma with uh, what's going to replace uh, the missing gap and how can we accelerate the reduction of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And this year's COP is going to be crucial to be a game changer in that, especially on oil and gas and renewables discussion. It hasn't been easy for oil and gas in the past couple of years due to Ukrainian crisis and pop pipelines in Europe uh, like locking down. A lot of focus has been how to supply um, this uh, energy source and how to keep the energy accessible and stable. And this year's COP and UAE presidency's role will be extremely important in making decisions for the next decade or two on what's going to happen in the energy transition discussion. Uh, it's been um, quite difficult for us to really push for uh, renewables being dominant source of energy for us to reduce greenhouse gas emissions due to uh, various uh, components, including the vague languages uh, that's been coming up in the past year or so. Um, the languages around carbon free, green, uh, many coal firing sources such as ammonia has been included in many um, energy narratives in Asia. Uh, we have witnessed this um, in various meetings, global meetings, such as the G7, uh, leading up to also G20, and also the APEC summit, which happened last week, where we have seen a very positive side where China endorsed uh, the triple renewables language along with the U.S., which is going to make it quite feasible for us to land on those um, pledges. However, we also saw Korea and Japan pushing for uh, hydrogen and ammonia co-firing as a partnership uh, between the two countries, which has something that's been quite new to the region where Korea and Japan collaborate publicly on an energy transition uh, package together. Um, so given all these uh, geopolitical dynamics, this year's COP and UAE's role will be extremely important and whether they could actually bring these different pledges into a binding text will be a big homework for the UAE. So uh, we're hoping that uh, Asia leadership that's going to be present at COP and other negotiators could take this opportunity to make it a turning point COP for UAE to really lift up the energy transition discussion so we don't land on any, any vague or any uncertain languages where we can just prolong fossil fuels lifespan. Thanks, Ginny. Great, thank you, Vivian. Next up, we have Jerry from the Center for Energy, Ecology and Development. Um, Jerry is a long-term climate and environmental advocate focusing on advancing energy transformation, ecological in integrity, and people-centered development as the executive director of the Center for Energy, Ecology and Development, otherwise known as SEED in the Philippines. Please go ahead, Jerry. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Um, and thanks for that uh, overview and context setting for uh, the lead up to COP, uh, Vivian. Um, it, this, this COP is very important, uh, more so because it's, it's also the, the stock tag. Um, and, and meaning that uh, world governments will actually be discussing if uh, the targets uh, by many and several countries uh, all the countries that are parties to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change are or add, adds up to uh, eventually uh, lead us to uh, achieving 1.5 degree goal, 
we all know what does that mean to Asia, uh, in particular to the country where I am from, uh, which is uh, in most cases the poster child of climate disasters, uh, as well as uh, the Pacific Island uh, countries. So the, this COP is very important. And one of the key back, backdrop of, of this COP uh, is actually how do we uh, pursue phasing out fossil, fossil fuel. Uh, and in particular, one of the key highlights uh, of the backdrop is in Asia in particular, is the, the detour that is happening uh, from the last decade away from, as, as what Vivian have mentioned, uh, uh, moving away from coal expansion which has been hot uh, in the last uh, couple of years in several countries actually across Asia is the detour on gas. Um, and it is very troubling uh, in terms of how, uh, what is its implication to the uh, overall target achieving uh, 1.5 degree, as well as the methane pledge, which was uh, pursued uh, a couple of COPs uh, before. Um, and, and one of the key features is that Asia is now the destination of uh, all the um, new gas expansion that is happening uh, because 66% of uh, the total uh, capacity that is being built now today uh, is actually in Asia. This is led by East Asia uh, and China in particular with around uh, 217 gigawatts followed by uh, Southeast Asia with around 116 uh, more or less gigawatts. Um, so this is this is very troubling because uh, the likes of the Philippines, in particular Southeast Asia, uh, were in um, there's been a, 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 an extreme rise of electricity rates, in particular in the Philippines, in the Mekong region, uh, uh, like Thailand, uh, as well as many other countries. Um, gas is is uh, being expanded um, in a big way uh, in the region, which uh, which would build uh, which would be actually the second largest import hub uh, uh, globally, and um, a lot of uh, financial institutions uh, and other uh, developed countries, in particular Japan, uh, but also the U.S. and Europe. Uh, and including the likes of Thailand are actually pouring in a lot of money in this expansion. Around 60 billion US dollars is being poured in uh, into the gas industry since 2016. And uh, it's getting bigger uh, to, to enable that expansion. Um, led by Japanese banks at, as the top lenders, uh, followed by uh, the Thai banks as top fund underwriters in the region. Um, so these countries, and in particular, the institutions that are originating from these countries are actually enabling that detour. Um, why do we say that it's a, a major detour? Uh, because the, the massive potential for renewable energy, in particular in Southeast Asia, is like 40 to 50 times uh, the current uh, electricity generation of the region. Um, and including that... Um, there is actually a pipeline of renewable energy projects in the region, which eclipses uh, even more than doubles the uh, existing uh, uh, gas capacities that are also in the pipeline. So this is a, a matter, it's a very important juncture for the region if uh, world leaders uh, that will be convening in COP will actually be deciding whether to pursue uh, a renewable energy shift in the region, uh, not just for Southeast Asia, but in Asia in general, or exacerbate further our dependence on fossil fuel and lose sight of uh, us uh, as a global community in achieving the 1.5 degree goal. So this is a very important uh, COP, uh, and we hope that uh, world leaders, uh, including uh, the UAE presidency will actually be uh, capable enough to actually um, lead the world uh, in traversing towards uh, the energy shift that is needed for the climate and for our people. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jerry. Um, next, um, we will invite um, Dr. Satyawati from Ember. 
Um, Dr. Sachawadi is Ember's Senior Electricity Policy Analyst for Southeast Asia, specializing in energy justice and sustainable development. She advocates for clean power adoption across sectors and is an author of peer-reviewed publications, including the book State of the Art Indonesia Energy Transition. Um, Dr. Sachawadi will be discussing the renewable energy transition in Southeast Asia. Thank you, Jeannie. And note about the alarming development on gas data in Asia from Gary. So I will highlight several points for Southeast Asia. The first is that Southeast Asia requires faster deployment of renewable energy because there are several reasons. The first is that the region is one of the fastest growing regions in terms of economic growth and population. Inevitably, energy demand will keep rising in the future. Second, economic growth and development are necessary, but ones that are being powered by renewable energy. And third, being the region vulnerable to climate change highlighted the need for accelerations of the transition to sustainable energy. The second highlight that I would like to make is that energy system must be tailored according to each country's unique features. Several Southeast Asian countries are also archipelagic in nature, consisting of smaller islands. Therefore, energy system of such islands needs to be designed according to the specific features. And some studies suggest incorporating smart energy system powered by photovoltaic battery systems would be the favorable backbone of a future energy system based on renewable energy. Next is that solar and wind are sustainable, cheap, and clean alternatives to replace coal and gas. Renewables, particularly solar and wind, are among the most sustainable and cleanest energy sources to replace coal and gas, particularly with the volatility in gas prices that could jeopardize the financial stability in the region. And actually, in our latest report, Beyond Tripling Asian, that was launched last week, we highlighted the potential for solar and wind in, in ASEAN countries. So you can download the report if you like. And then I also want to make a point that this US technology is still in early stages, expensive, and needs time to mature. So the US technology is still in infancy, costly, and it may take a while before it becomes a mature technology that is economically viable. So we are seeing a lot of this US projects or feasibility studies being commissioned in Southeast Asia, however, having a laser-like focus on such technology might risk prolonging the life of fossil fuels while diverting investments from clean energy. So instead of starting from scratch feasibility studies in this US, we could use the money to fund research and development in solar, wind, or battery technology. And my last point is that Southeast Asia decarbonization will benefit from fast and cheap solutions like wind, solar, and battery storage. So I think that in the term and mid-term Southeast Asia decarbonization efforts will benefit more from the quick and cheap solutions like the similar solar, coupled with increasingly advancing battery storage technology. In the long run, CCS might play a role in decarbonization hard to obey sectors. But the economic and viability of the technologies need to be drastically improved before this can happen. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now we will invite Lave Tanalagi Seru from the Pacific Island Climate Action Network. Lave Tanalagi is a climate justice activist and is currently the regional coordinator for the Pacific Islands Climate Action Network. They will be discussing the Pacific climate situation um, ahead of um, COP28. Thank you, Jeannie, and I hope you can hear me. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'll start by saying that it is without a doubt that the Pacific region is at the front lines of uh, the climate crisis, experiencing the most devastating and the disproportionate impacts of climate change. Our leaders have recognized it as the region's single greatest security and existential threat, threatening our well-being, livelihoods, and security. The alarming trend of climate-induced severe disasters this year is a reminder of the injustice and the realities that our people and communities have to deal with. Pacific Islanders are 
abandoning their homes with over 50,000 people being displaced each year. And this number is going to see a stark increase if little to no action is taken now. The reports from the IPCC, the UN and others have shown the gap between rhetoric and action and the need for deep, radical and immediate emission cuts across all sectors, including the immediate phase out of fossil fuel and accelerating the just and equitable transition to renewables. The countries that have contributed the most to cause the climate crisis, such as the US, Norway, Canada, UK, Australia, New Zealand, are clearly avoiding their responsibilities to address the root causes of climate change, including not committing to the phase out of fossil fuel with an end date, not committing to um, you know the further expansion of um, uh, sorry, not committing to ending any further expansion of the fossil fuel industry, nor ending subsidies to fossil fuel companies. Neither have these countries provided adequate climate finance to support climate frontline countries to adapt to the impacts of climate change and address climate induced loss and damage. And if they do. It is often in the form of loans and not grants and or are tied to agreements that, are, that disadvantages our countries. In the recent 52nd Pacific Islands Forum Leaders Meeting, there was a historic commitment made by the leaders uh, for a just and equitable transition to a fossil fuel free Pacific. Although it fell, uh, you know, it falls short of the, the, the ambition uh, that's needed uh, and that's required to respond to um to the um to the to the realities this declaration uh however underscores the determination of the pacific to lead by example and pave the way towards a sustainable and resilient future um also at last week's pacific island forum leaders meeting a number of countries have pledged funding to address climate change in the pacific um, for instance, uh, the, the United Arab Emirates committed funds to the Pacific Resilience Facility. Uh, we also saw Australia signing a deal with Tuvalu to offer a climate migration pathway. However, these are just band-aid solution because if they do not address the root cause of the climate crisis, which is extracting, producing and exporting fossil fuel, then the Pacific will see um, you know, unprecedented levels of um, 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 of climate-induced uh, impacts, including death, the loss of identity, culture and traditions, food shortages, disruption to our livelihoods, and more. Um, and I'll end there. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now I will invite the last speaker for the press briefing today, um, Polly Heming from Australia Institute. Polly is the director of the Australia Institute's Climate and Energy Program. She has extensive experience working in policy, marketing, and engagement roles in both nonprofit and public sectors. Um, Polly will be touching on the Australia climate situation um, ahead of COP. Thanks, Jenny. Uh, Australia is one of the world's largest fossil fuel exporters. It, it would love to be number one, and it's been angling for that title for a number of years. We are the world's second largest exporter of thermal coal, the largest for metallurgical coal, and the second largest exporter of LNG, and that doesn't look set to change. So Australia Institute research has shown that there are more than 100 new gas and coal mines listed as under development in Australia. Not all of those will go ahead, I know, but that's a significant number that is recognised by the Australian government. Diplomatic engagement remains heavily focused on securing markets for Australia's fossil fuels. Since being elected in 2022, the Albanese government has approved four coal mines, the drilling of 116 new gas wells, and facilitated development of one of the world's largest untapped gas reserves. Just last week, the government passed legislation that would allow carbon dioxide to be transported from Australian gas projects into Timorese waters. For, in our foreign minister's own words, Santos, Woodside and INPEX, and for the Korean and Japanese governments. The Australian government uses announcements. You would have heard possibly uh, if you've kept track of, of the policy situation in Australia, there are 
there's a lot of rhetoric about uh, renewable energy and being a renewable energy superpower, uh, increasingly about climate adaptation too, particularly in relation to small island developing states. These announcements ostensibly distract the world from the fact that state and federal governments in Australia not only have no plan to phase out fossil fuels, they are aggressively pursuing their expansion at a state and federal level. And this will be the same at COP28. So it is true that the government has announced policies and funding for domestic emissions reductions. It's also true that it that Australia has signalled its intention to become a significant exporter of renewable energy, uh, including green hydrogen. However, green energy exports are expected to augment, not replace, increased fossil fuel exports. All our projections show that the government is intending to increase coal and LNG exports. Domestically, our emissions are increasing and not falling, and renewable energy in a domestic setting is lagging. So Australia's diplomacy and foreign policy is designed to secure ongoing markets for our gas and coal, or alternatively, to obstruct the climate ambition of others so those markets are not undermined. And, and Lange can speak, um, I think, with some authority to that. Lately, the Australian and Japanese governments have been speaking in lockstep, saying that Australia must keep selling gas to its Asian customers to ensure security in the region, conflating trade relationships and energy security with regional and national security. Historically, Australia has been using the UNFCCC and the COP for decades to protect its resources industry and to block ambition, and it's worked really well. I'm happy to talk more about that, but expect to see more of this uh, going forward using multilateral forums. Australia essentially leads the world in what we call at the Australia Institute state-sponsored greenwash. It's not hyperbole to say that successive governments, including this one, effectively run a protection racket for the fossil fuel industry. We have a government certified offset scheme that allows gas companies to say they're net zero. The government is providing licenses and legislation for carbon capture and storage exploration, will allow gas, which will allow gas companies to say that they will have or promise that they'll have no net impact on the climate, whether the CCS eventuates or not. And the government is now opposing or proposing a moratorium on greenwashing litigation, meaning that civil society cannot uh, launch litigation proceedings for greenwashing against corporations. And this is all while the government is prematurely celebrate, celebrating hosting COP31 with Pacific countries in 2026. So effectively, Australia is a petrostate. Uh, historically, evidence shows us that it's a bad faith actor and uh, my uh, my opinion is that it should be treated as such regardless of the rhetoric that it brings to COP28. It's my guess that Australia will be lobbying very heavily on any language around abated or unabated fossil fuels because it's the, the notion of abated that Australia is relying on domestically and internationally. And the government will also lean more heavily on the argument that fossil fuels are critical for regional, regional security in the Asia-Pacific region um, otherwise, I anticipate that the government will probably engage on peripheral topics that make for good PR, but mean that ultimately, as a nation state, we're under less scrutiny over our fossil, fossil fuel expansion, such as adaptation and climate finance. Thanks, Ginny. Great. Thank you, everyone. Um, now we will move on to Q&A. Um, you can either ask to be unmuted or type in your question in the chat below. Um, another quick reminder that the questions are reserved only for journalists. Um, so we will get started. The first question is, apparently 60 countries have already agreed to triple renewable energy outlet output. Um, is this an extension of what was agreed at G20 or something, um, something new? What are the next steps needed at COP28? And I will direct this question to Vivian. Thanks, Jenny. Um, thanks for your question. Um, so yes, this pledge, the renewable pledge, is a continuation of what's been pitched since the beginning of the year, actually, from the Berlin Energy Transition Dialogue, is when uh, Al Jabbar, the COP uh, presidency, has formally used this language uh, into an open event. And the language has been popped up since Berlin Energy Transition Dialogue, 
G7, G20, uh, ministerial meetings, um, and also at Bonn. So this is a language that's been sort of coming out in various uh, events throughout the year. So yes, it's an extension of these agreed outcomes, but it'll be a pledge that's expected to be announced at COP signed by countries. Now, this is not a pledge that's embedded into the final text. So it's important that the final text also reemphasizes the triple renewables ambition, and it's um, giving the countries the binding commitment to achieve the triple renewables at the global level. Um, the pledge also includes uh, discussions around uh, doubling um, energy efficiency. And also to answer your second question, uh, it actually does lay out a different mechanisms and policies that need to be revised or looked into and revisited by each government to achieve triple renewables. And some of them are uh, such as looking into the permitting and licensing issues of each country, why it's um, making it difficult and becoming obstacles for renewables to expand at an accelerating speed. And also it mentions a slight, uh, slight reference to revisiting the design of the market uh, as we see it now. So that could be the power market or that could be the renewables market where um, different renewables are calculated for in their terms of their price. So there needs to be a lot of uh, market infrastructure that needs to be revised because the current market infrastructure we have in Asia especially is the is used to or it's accommodating the fossil fuel industry. And that how that's how it's been so far. However, to tackle this 1.5 and greenhouse gas emission, not only carbon, but other emissions as well, there needs to be a revision to tailor and make it so that the market is um, friendly and compatible and equal to fair to renewables. So I hope that answers your question. Okay, I have one follow-up question. You During the discussion, it was mentioned that how Australia is stepping up its fossil fuels exports. And I think there are also concerns about Indonesia being a large exporter of fossil fuels. So are they going to be uh, signatories to this agreement for tripling renewable energy production? And will this be at the, uh, will they pledge, is, is there an expectation that they pledge to stop fossil fuel production and exports or gradually reduce it? I can say what I can say is it's we have seen China, US, EU being endorsed to this pledge. There has been a number of countries at developing and um, also developed country levels that's been endorsing this pledge now. So I think it's going to stand out if a country does not endorse this pledge. However, I must say that this pledge is not directly related to fossil fuel reduction ambition. And this is why it is the job of uh, many negotiators and UAE presidency to bring these two things together. Because if we wanna ramp up renewables, there needs to be confident in renewables by each country to be able to bring down uh, their uh, also uh, reduction of fossil fuel, uh, uh, reduction of fossil fuels. So I think these go hand in hand, but right now the pledge as it stands is very much focused on how to expand and accelerate renewables. So it is the job of the presidency and also the negotiators to bring these two topics together because they do go hand in hand, in fact. So I hope uh, I hope that uh, makes sense. Thank you very I might, much. I could I just add something to the Australian context yeah. there yes, very quickly? Yes, uh, and I, I did type it in the answer, but uh, if the, in the Australian context, it's entirely plausible that Australia would sign a pledge like that because that's exactly what uh, the Australian government is intending, is that renewables are completely disparate from fossil fuels. So we do talk about exporting increasing amounts of uh, green hydrogen or electricity through underground cable, but at the same time that we are also talking about increasing our gas and coal output too. So for I think for some governments it is a loophole where you can say we are going to aggressively pursue renewable energy but the quiet bit or the bit they don't say is that that is in addition to fossil fuels. I agree they should be interlinked, but it's a really good point. They're not necessarily. Great. Thank you, Polly. Um, I will also invite Jerry to elaborate on um, the renewable energy ambition. Yes. Um, thank you, Jeannie. Um, 
maybe it's a I, I think even in the Southeast East Asia region, even in particular in the Philippines, there's a lot of momentum to actually increase the target for renewable energy. Um, and as what we've seen in the Southeast Asian region, it is actually being led by the Philippines and uh, Vietnam in terms of uh, the Philippine Energy Plan and the PDP of PDP eight of of Vietnam. So there is that momentum uh, to actually raise the ambition. Uh, in terms of targets uh, and reflective of the, the vast potential in the region, which is 40 to 50 times compared to uh, the whole electricity uh, capacity right now of, of the region. Um, but one of the, the challenges there is that uh, most of these countries are also pursuing gas expansion. And, and from what we've seen, um, while uh, there is that uh, raising of ambition, it, uh, the actual uh, procurement of, of or, or usage of electricity from coming from renewable energy are being el elbowed by gas. So meaning the the actual and it's creating that problem. Uh, so it's it's uh, that's why we're calling it as a detour uh, in terms of fully harnessing that capacity. The second point that I wanted to to um, my two cents on on the renewable energy target is that it's actually. Uh, it should be aligned to um, the, the our, our collective North Star, which is 1.5 degree uh, pathway. Um, and we just uh, released this report uh, just recently, uh, which actually showed for the Philippines to actually be aligning to 1.5 degree. It has to achieve 83%, 80 to 83% of renewable energy uh, target by 2030. Uh, that is a fit coming from a around 22% right now. So, uh, and it has dwindled for the last 10 years because of coal expansion. It will it will further dwindle if gas expansion is being pursued. But the, the good thing there is that for the Philippines, uh, if we do not add any more fossil fuel, in, uh, in particular fossil gas, because it is being prioritized uh, in the next uh, seven years until we reach 2030, the target, um, the, the Philippines is poised to actually achieve around 59% of renewable energy target, jumping from 22% because of the approval of a lot of new renewable energy projects that are um, that are uh, uh, through the green energy auction. So that's the second point, um, meaning that renewable energy uh, projects are already laid out and being pursued. It's only being elbowed by, uh, uh, you know, the parallel uh, pursuit for gas expansion. The third point that I wanted to stress, and it, and and it's aligned to the 1.5 degree. In fact, the 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 goal for for respective countries in Southeast Asia. The third, the last point that I wanted to make is that in in this study uh, for the Philippines, it's it doesn't only align to 1.5, but it actually addresses the perennial problem of um, rising cost of electricity in the country. Uh, wherein it's really a burden even for uh, producers or manufacturers, which would entail 40% of their overhead just to invest in the Philippines. So renewable energy shift would actually also address uh, these problems of uh, you know uh, electricity, high electricity cost in the region. Thank you, Jerry. Um, and did you want to add any points um, to elaborate on why gas might not be a valid um, long-term energy transition solution? Um, this is a question from David Stanway from Reuters. Uh, China and others would still say that natural gas is at least cleaner than coal and is a valid interim solution for the long-term energy transition. Do you have anything to add on this point? Thank, thanks, Ginny. Um, uh, from our perspective, um, having seen the you know the, the 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 massive push of coal in Southeast Asia in the last decade, it's almost like deja vu for us. Uh, it's like a rehash of all the myth of coal. Um, that we need coal to actually cheapen electricity. We need coal because it's actually there's clean technology. Uh, you don't need to worry about uh, you know pollution. We need coal uh, because we need it for development, so on and so forth. Um, and the, the good thing about that is that science is there to actually help us. Um, secondly, that 
the alternative is there, uh, which is renewable energy. And the, 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 the case of the Philippines is a very classic case wherein it was ninth overall in, in 2017 in terms of coal expansion, global. So just imagine a very vulnerable country, a poster child of uh, in Warsaw um, on climate disasters and uh, building ninth largest uh, in terms of coal expansion. And what was what, what was really the element there was good is that renewable energy was actually right for uh, ex expansion and explosion with all the policies that have been pursued. And so that's why we're now in that juncture. So looking uh, uh, going back to gas, it's 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 like deja vu for me and for many of us. Um, um, yes, it is an argument in Southeast Asia and South Asia that gas is half the in terms of CO2 emission versus coal. But it doesn't account the methane leaks, the methane uh, em uh, emissions, which if you look at the whole value chain from where it is extracted, from where it is uh, processed, deposited, and um, uh, liquefied to actually be shipped to the likes of Southeast Asia and my country and South Asia, the whole value chain, and, and if you counterpose it to the one uh, the EIA report, it, it's a no-brainer to be pursuing it, right? Uh, it's 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 um and even policymakers who are pushing for new uh, policy governance on gas in the Philippines are actually uh, in agreement that it is mainly methane. So therefore, there's an argument that for countries like the Philippines and many Southeast Asia who signed the methane pledge. There has to be a correlation in terms of do we actually be pursuing this? Um, there's a lot of arguments still, um, but one of the key, I think, is that there, there is this notion that uh, gas is needed as a bridge fuel. Unfortunately, in all the plans that I've seen, whether that is the PDB-8 or the Philippine Energy Plan or many plans, a bridge always has an end. And I haven't seen a very concrete end in all those plans. So I think, and that's why I'm saying that it's it is a rehash. Um, it's it, it if we allow gas to be actually be built, it will be there for the next forty years, and it will become the new stranded asset. And what do we end up with? Uh, uh, climate disasters as well as new bailouts, just like what ETMs are actually being pursued right now for gold. Great. Thank you so much, Jerry. Um, and we will now move on to David Fogarty's um, question. What are some of the key tactics the fossil fuel industry and fossil fuel de dependent governments will deploy at COP28 to try to prevent ambitious global climate action, especially language around phasing out fossil fuels? And I will invite Lagi to respond to this question. Thanks, um, and thanks for the question. I think um, one of the things about COP and, and, and some of the other um, multilateral uh, spaces is that it's becoming very um, heavily um, captured by uh, the corporate uh, industry. And uh, some of the figures from you know the recent COP has shown that Pacific delegates have been outnumbered 12 to 1 by fossil fuel lobbyists um, in these COP spaces. And I think the, um, you know, the fossil fuel uh, lobbyists uh, will be hard at work um, at, at, at this COP space and uh, um, trying, to, um, trying to showcase some of the ways it is dealing with some of the concerns that have been raised here. Um, including showcasing some of the the ways they're greenwashing and blue washing, um, uh, you know their 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 bad records. Um, we are also seeing uh, you know alliances being formed, deals being signed off at some of these um, side events and uh, pavilions, including uh, bilaterals between governments, uh, pursuing you know further um, markets for uh, fossil fuel um, supply. And uh, I think we'll also see, you know, uh, we are like likely to see, you know, these fossil fuel lobbies pushing some of the um, the the languages, um, you know, that are loopholes, such as, you know, 
phase down of fossil um, fossil fuel rather than a phase out. Um, the the promotion of uh, abated fossil fuel, promoting carbon capture and storage uh, technologies, which you know a number of uh, scientific reports have dismissed. So I think these are some of the things that we can expect to see from uh, fossil fuel uh, lobbyists and interest groups uh, within um, uh, this year's COP. Thanks. Right. Um, Polly, would you like to add anything to this? It's uh, echoing what uh, Langy said. I think the fight is going to be about abated and unabated. I think these countries, the fossil fuel industry and fossil fuel dependent or captured more likely governments because Australia is in no way dependent on fossil fuels. Uh, our government is just captured by it. Fossil fuels do not make a significant contribution to our economy. But in order to avoid talking about fossil fuels, the conversation will be, in the first instance, I think about climate finance, adaptation, everything that avoids talking about fossil fuels when it comes to the crunch, because I think it will be unavoidable at this COP, especially from the Pacific and Caribbean states who have had enough of the obfuscation uh, and who are the ones suffering the most from the climate crisis. The conversation about fossil fuels will be forced and that's when uh, there will be a lot of obstruction in terms of talking about abated and unabated. To add to Lange's point about the tools of delay, Article 6, um, the methodologies for uh, Article 6, six that's the, the global carbon market, the, the global offset scheme have now been finalised. In, as well as doing side deals about fossil fuel supp supply, there are a lot of side deals being done with uh, the Global South to supply carbon offsets to fossil fuel dependent or fossil fuel producing countries. So uh, offsets and Article 6 will be another big one and carbon capture and storage. We already know that the COP president is a big fan of that. So are countries like Australia, um, the UK increasingly. So I think those... Kind of the language, but also those mechanisms will be very heavily emphasised by um, big emitting countries. Thank you. Um, and Vivian, did you want to uh, um, elaborate on anything? Yeah, I'll just keep it very short. I mean, I think it echoes pretty much what everyone uh, in this room have said. I, I think we need to be very cautious of reading the language um, in this COP text and making sure um, everything is sort of included when we mention greenhouse gas emission reduction. Uh, like Jerry said, methane is a huge player in oil and gas industry, and a lot of the texts are referring to carbon free, or a lot of the texts are a little bit vague and abated and unabated. I mean, these things are some things that we need to be very uh, conscious of and making sure that the language doesn't leave any vague room for interpretation. Um, that being said, uh, one of the biggest discussion at COP this year will be finance. And um, th that's, I think that could require a whole new, different uh, presser event for that. But um, it's important that we don't leave room for gas lock-in investments for the next decades or so when our NDC NDCs have to be uh, met, when our uh, long-term uh, targets have to be met, 2050, 2060, and so on, where investments flow going into gas is going to be locked in for a couple of decades and that's going to be make that's going to become a huge obstacle for renewables industry and the grid and the power market industry to receive uh, finance on their part to be able to accommodate to flexible grids so it's important that we think about all of these aspects because oil and gas discussions and renewables do really go hand in hand. And right now, as it stands, the pledge is quite separate from one another, but there needs to be a bridge and that's COP uh, presidency's role to have these discussion uh, into a bridged conversation. Thank you. Um, and we will go to um, the question on um, what is needed at COP28 to realize its renewable energy potential, uh, which is 40 or 50 times the current levels. Um, so um, Dr. Satyawati, would you like to elaborate on this point, as well as giving um, an overview of the current state and progress of, of uh, tripling renewable energy? Okay, sure. So um, I think that we need um, policy support, international support, financing, and also technological transfer to developing countries. And um, in order for the countries to be in line with the net zero emission scenario that was recently published by the IEA, 
we we see a chart um, depicting that these countries need to increase their wind and solar here in their each, each of the country's electricity systems. And I think that having an ambitious policy target for these renewable energy, solar and wind development, and aligning them with the national development plan, with the narrative of sustainable development, it's important to drive the addiction, the adoption of both technologies. And um, in terms of the stripling of renewables, firstly, it's it not it's mean it's that it's every it's country is required it's to achieve a tripling of capacity. Because starting close to zero and tripling is not ambitious, whereas some countries are beyond the point that triple renewables capacity is realistic or needed. So we need to see the combined solar and wind share in the electricity mix to give indications of the level of ambition in order to, you know, to align ourselves with the zero emission scenario. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so uh, with that, now we have around 10 minutes left um, for the remaining questions and answer section. Um, I will now invite um, open mic questions. Um, if anyone wants to just unmute and ask, um, please go ahead. Hi, it's um, David here from Reuters. Just want to get your thoughts on um, the information uh, last week that came out of China uh, or from analysts looking at China saying that um, it was very likely that emissions would peak uh, next year. Um, are you encouraged by this? Uh, does this give some kind of um, um, positive signal um, for COP28? Thank you. I can briefly speak on it. And if other colleagues would like to jump in, you're more than welcome. Uh, I think it's a positive sign that there is some sort of an ambition from China's side to contribute um, in a quicker way than before. We have, before the APEC summit, we actually saw uh, Governor Gavin Newsom go to China and meet with a number of subnational governments in China. In that meeting, one of the things that the subnational governments decided to really commit to is to accelerate their peak year. So I think there is a movement from China side to try to uh, contribute to the 1.5 and the Paris aligned goals. And the fact that they've really endorsed the triple renewables is a sign of them wanting to open a dialogue and have a conversation. But on the flip side, the different kind of investments that's going in from China on fossil fuels industry and a continuous support for coal is something to also be wary of. And um, it's to say, well, China is a huge monster and they're doing both. And I think it's important that we encourage China to keep on showing their renewables and uh, power market uh, reform and grid um, transition. But at the same time, it would be good and really important to see China's also reduction of fossil fuel investments and also uh, thereof China's uh, continued support for fossil fuel industries. Thank you. Um, would anyone else like to uh, um, come in with additional questions? If I can make a point about, I think call moratorium is also a very important place. For example, in the Philippines here, please correct me if I'm wrong, have um, announced a moratorium for coal since 2020. And um, for Southeast Asian countries that's heavily dependent on coal, I think this this line of pledge and also you know um, promising to change the narrative from coal to other cleaner renewable energy sources would would be important and one that we want to see from the COP twenty eight. Thank you. Um, yep, opening the floor again for questions. Um, I also see David left a comment um, that there is a strong narrative from the oil and gas sector 
um, and especially uh, the UAE and Saudi Arabia, but also Woodside and Australia, to focus on cutting emissions from production, but ignoring the vast amount of emissions from consumption. If anyone wants to elaborate on this point, um, please do go ahead. Um, actually, another question um, from David from the Straits Times. Um, what announcements, and this is a question for Dr. Um, Sejawati, what announcements do we expect on the Indonesia Jet P initiative at COP28, if any? Yes, so thank you, David, for this question. So we know that the CITP document was just released um, several, this month, uh, I think several weeks ago for the public comment. And it shows a larger share of renewable energy in the energy sector. But um, I think we might expect announcements on increasing the renewable energy share, but uh, we will never fully know until the policy documents or the new um, RFSL is being publicized and announced by the state out to the company. So, so that's my take on this. Just to weigh on David's question, um, as um, from from our end, as we look at um, the the pipeline of gas in in the region, the the gas plants pipeline, as well as importation, um, notwithstanding uh, the existing coal fleets uh, in Southeast Asia region, that needs to actually be. Um, transition and phased out with haste. Um, I think the 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 emissions reduction uh, from the production side should actually really go in hand hand in hand because it has um, it has a push and pull uh, dynamics. Um, as long as there is an uptick for an appetite for more consumption and cost of fuel, in particular in Asia. Uh, it will have a corresponding pressure to be creating or opening up new gas uh, fields and vice versa. So um, re reducing or cutting emissions from both production and consumption side should actually really be pursued and, and should go hand in hand. Um, and, and in most cases, uh, like in particular with, you know, what, what's what's been happening in terms of new gas fields that's being opened up uh, across the fund, across the globe, in particular in the U.S., in Latin America, in Africa, and even in in um, in the Middle East, where developed countries are always being used as you know that we need those gas uh, for our development pathways. So we need to be able to to argue, and this is why renewable energy concrete targets from respective countries should actually be aligned and uh, correlated to NDC targets. Um, that's that's my 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 first uh, 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 like uh, two cents on, on, on that question. I'll, I'll probably answer it, uh, or or pitch in the others uh, later. Wonderful. Um, so we have a couple of minutes left before we wrap up. Um, I want to invite um, if um, oh sorry. Uh, there, um, there is one last question. I think this will be the last one. Um, so it's uh, asking, what are your expectations from the U.S. and Chinese leaders recently meeting at COP28? I believe Vivian has touched upon um, the China aspect. Does anyone want to elaborate on um, the U.S. Um, side? Maybe I'll just um, pitch on that, Jenny. Sure. Yeah. On, on the U.S. side, um, um, I think overall there's a lot of lagging behind. Uh, we we all know that already. Uh, taking into account the historical responsibility of the U.S. Um, and there's a lot of uh, loopholes that have been also been pushed. Uh, and undermining in so many conversations, whether that is COP26, COP27, or even before that. Um, so we hope 
that the US will actually, you know, be be able to overcome all the challenges as it as it correlate with you know domestic needs uh, of its country. Um, but like for for uh, and most of these loopholes, like in, in concrete terms, uh, the 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 issue on unabated and uh, the the debate on unabated, uh, it has to be overcome. Uh, because that's where, as well as gas comes in, um, and and taking into account that the U.S. have expanded or opened up, uh, and, and still pushing for the opening up of a lot of its gas fields, um, it will it will actually you know, to the one point five degrees will be a gone a gone conclusion, um, and, and it would even be harder to actually achieve two degrees if all those gas fields are open. So and and it's not like the U.S. are not experiencing or is not experiencing the climate disasters that it has experienced in the recent times. So I think both the U.S. and China, being um, really big countries and are capable countries to actually be putting in a lot of uh, finance in terms of the energy transition, both domestically and internationally, could actually play a very crucial role in this uh, in the COP twenty eight. Um, taking into account the challenges also faced by the Middle East countries. Great, thank you so much. And with that, we will wrap up today's media briefing. Um, a quick note that there will be another press briefing later today with different experts for the Latin America, Africa, and US time zone. Um, and lastly, if you have any media inquiries, uh, we, will be, we will be sending you a follow-up email with information from today's briefing and ways um, that you can reach out to us. Um, thank you all so much for joining us today. Have a great, great rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks, Jeannie. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. I'm going to stop recording.